You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the 1200th episode of Author Stories, where we, for 1200 episodes, have brought you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. And today, one of my very favorite storytellers joins me again today, Owen Coffer. You know him from the Artemis Fowl series and now the Fowl Twin series uh, of books, and he has a brand new uh edition in that series book three the foul twins get what they deserve uh is out available everywhere now and you can go grab it uh when you're hearing this oh and welcome back to the show it's gl- i'm glad to have you back yeah thanks hank uh, 1200 episodes uh, that's how many, crazy isn't it how, many, how long is that is that years it must uh be. eight eight years we're in our eighth year now wow well uh, congratulations yeah. and well, it's great you. to have shows like yours out there you know because uh sometimes writers feel like it's hard to get our voice heard so it's just brilliant to have shows that are totally concentrated on books and writers so we do appreciate it well thank you if if it weren't for you we wouldn't have a show and and folks like you but uh so book three in the foul twin series uh is out now uh you know when uh, all those years ago when you started with artemis fowl and dreamt up this this fantasy world that you know was connected to to our world did you ever see uh this series going where it has gone well to be honest hank when i started it was a one and done kind of deal for me because i up to that point i had been writing my books in the in the spare bedroom in our little house which which had become the baby's bedroom at this point and uh, they had done very nicely in Ireland and strangely enough Denmark um, but that was kind of it and then they paid for the summer holiday maybe uh, so when I wrote this book um, the first Artemis Fowl book I, I really thought I don't know how many people are going to read this because it doesn't have a traditional hero um, and it's about Ireland so I, I felt I was creating a venn diagram uh, and in the middle of that diagram was a very small intersection of people who would read the book so i thought i'll do one and um i, I wasn't even sure i would get it published and um so it was a complete shock to me when i sent the manuscript to an agent the first time i'd ever troubled an agent and uh, she took me on and we've been together for over 20 years now and uh, in within two months i think she had sold the movie rights and sold the book to several publishers worldwide i was just every day seemed it was like christmas because i was getting another phone call to say well we've sold it in uh, yugoslavia or we've sold it in norway or we've sold it in australia and i just couldn't believe this was happening and uh and really from there it's been ever since then it's been a little bit of a roller coaster of every year another book or maybe two books coming out and uh, I think because I was married already and with a mortgage and I was in my 30s that I didn't really have my head turned. I just wanted to keep working, keep working. And and I've been like that ever since. And so since that time, I think I've had 40 books um, come out and there's been foul video games, foul movies, foul graphic novels, foul comic books everything and it's just been it's this little book that's just taken over my my career and i'm i'm delighted that's happened but it's really difficult to just get your head around it i mean when someone says to you 25 million copies you can't even imagine how what they would look like stacked on top of each other so i prefer just to think of it as a case by case basis, you know, when I meet people like yourself, I'm talking to you. Or if I'm if I meet someone who read a book like I read met someone today, I'm just talking to that kid. So I, I avoid the larger picture, if you know what I mean. It, it's so interesting um, because writers are some of the only people that you get to talk to and you get to talk in terms of 
uh, the way that we communicate with these fictional characters. You know, you, you, you talk to a writer and they say, well, I, I just I wrote down what the what the character told me they were going to do. And, yeah. you know, you get to talk in terms like that, that no one else on Earth gets to gets to talk about uh, without, you know, people thinking that you're crazy. Um, do you ever feel like that the Fowl family is is part of your extended family? And, you know, we're we're in the holiday season now. And do, do you ever feel this strange connection to these make believe people? It's funny, you do feel that. And I, I remember hearing that from people early on that the characters were speaking to them. And, and I really poo pooed that whole idea and I didn't have any time for that. But uh, as I get older and as I get deeper into that family, I, I understand it. And I've actually thought about it and why it's happening. It seems to me that it's a conversation between the conscious brain and the, the unconscious. Um, and basically the unconscious or the subconscious has figured all these things out and it just takes a while for the conscious brain to to come to terms with or to realize what your unconscious already knows and also because i've based these characters on mostly my own family members it's like my brothers are speaking to me or my sons or my wife or, or whatever or my mates and and that's how i see the characters because very early on i had this really bad habit that some writers have and my bad habit was i would all the characters would slowly turn into me so um, I would start with a generic bad guy and pretty much he would become me in a bad mood and then the hero would be me in a good mood and the, <laughs> it, it, it got quite boring even for me and I thought wow if it, this is boring me it must be really boring for anyone reading it so I said the only way I can solve this problem is to base the character on somebody else who who's real and then when the character has to say something I don't ask myself, what would I say? You you ask yourself, what would this character say? And in that way, I felt the books were becoming, a, at the very least, a little more varied. Um, and so now when I'm writing, I can hear the voices of my family members or whoever it is that I've based the characters on. And they do say, no, you know, that's not what I would say. And if I try and put in something that's not true to that character, it just sounds wrong and clunky. And so I have to go back to the source, which is the character themselves or the real person and, and ask myself, well, you know, what would my son Sean say at this point um, if he was in this situation? And it really helps the books along. And then sometimes it extends to actions. So it's not just what they would say, but, you know, which would they turn left or right? Would they climb the tree or go on the train tracks? You know, all these decisions are kind of made for you, which in a way is, is very uh, handy. So with a character like Artemis Fowl, who, uh, you know, like you alluded to earlier, millions of books sold, video games, spinoffs, all of this, uh, you know, all all along that way, a character like Artemis becomes fully formed in uh, in interesting ways. But I would think that when you have a, a series character that runs as long as he did, um, that you might start feeling um confined uh by this character's traits and maybe that's not the right description to use but i i think you'll understand what i what i'm getting at yeah. um and is is that why um miles and beckett uh you know when when they come along they they open up you know you've got this world that you've built you've got this family um that you've constructed and all of the 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 different forces uh, at play in the foul world but these two new characters, the the twins, Miles and Beckett, what did they bring to the world um, that, uh, you know, that kind of opened up your creativity again? Yeah, when I was coming to the end of the Artemis uh, arc of the foul world, I just, you're right, the word confined is right, because you feel his character is formed now. It's eight books in. He's learned what he needs to learn to become a good person he, you know, if you if you write any more books with him, you're going to have to do something else to to make him into a villain again, so he can be Artemis Fowl. But really, that's cheating the audience because you've brought him along so far; they've made the journey with him, and now you're going to strip all that away. And I've done that already a few times. He'd lost his memory and he'd gone back in time. There was there was all sorts of little tricks to make him into a villain again. So. 
I just felt in fairness to everybody, myself included, that it was time just to, uh, you know, draw a line under Artemis and let him retire. Um, but I and and I'm in fact I intended to retire the whole family, uh, and just leave them be and you know let them live on a on a farm as we say about old dogs and, but uh, <laughs> after about five years or six years I just felt that I I started to feel this thing that I'd never felt before which was pride, in the work which I had not ever experienced that where I was happy with something that I had done and and looking back on the the foul, ver, foul universe I just thought you know that was pretty good and I really enjoyed doing that and I I created that and um, if anyone's going to play around in that it, it should be me so I wanted to find a way back in and, and the way back in was Miles and Beckett and, because they were not formed at all a lot of the other characters that I had used they kind of had been around for the all the books, but Miles and Beckett were just little throwaways, really, and they didn't have any characteristics. So there was something that could be done with them. There was a freshness about them. They were a clean slate. So I was able to go into the into the, back into that universe, and these guys were my entry point. Uh, so they just uh, kind of developed with me, and you know, it was very much as we went along. So we all arrived at the same point, knowing nothing about these two guys. And then very quickly, they developed into these uh, quite scintillating characters. And, um, and and I really enjoyed the first book more than I thought I would. And uh, and I enjoyed the whole trilogy, actually. But I think now is probably the time to let them go and um, for me to take another few years away from that universe. So just to recharge my own batteries and to, I don't want to feel that constrained again. So I wouldn't do eight books with these guys. I think three is probably enough. And if I go back to the Fowl universe in a few more years, I quite fancy the idea of doing it from a fairy's point of view and picking out one of those characters. Um, and maybe maybe I won't go near the Fowl family at all, but uh, who knows? Who knows what will happen in a few years? But for the moment, I feel this book is really funny and it's a real send off for the two youngsters. And um, I'm quite happy to uh, let them sail off into space on their own and, and I'll take a back seat and just watch them go. One thing that I love about um, the foul twins is that with a character like Artemis, um, you, you learn all of his kind of ins and outs and what makes him who he is. But with a, a set of twins, um, you get the benefit of having characters that are the same age and, and really experiencing life together. And a lot of their experiences are the same, but they're two very different people and their um, their reaction to to the world and events can be very different and their expressions can be very different. As a writer, what did it do for you to have two protagonists that are the same age and um, you know, the same experience level, um, but two very different people. What did that do for you? Well, what it did was it gave you the opportunity to have two different points of view from, from every scene. So you could really explore every every scene, everything that they went through from two points of view. And there's, there's a certain amount of humor to be mined from that. But most importantly, I think, if you have two characters who are quite different in a room, you have inherently got drama. So you, all you had to do was drop Miles and Beckett into the same situation. And just without anything really happening, they would be bickering and fighting and there would be something going on. But just because they could they could argue over a, a, you know, a rock they found in the street, they could argue about that. So that was quite funny. And the, the challenge of every book was the moment would come when they realized that they had to work together. And that was always, for me, the important moment. So how could you bring them to that point? I mean, they knew ultimately that they loved each other and that they were, you know, they would do anything for each other except work together. They would do anything uh, in their own individual powers, but they found it hard just to, you know, combine their uh, their superpowers uh, and win the day. But towards the end of every book, they come to that realization. Oh, the only way we're getting out of this is if Miles and Beckett actually... Uh, pool their resources and, and for me that was always the real climax uh maybe not adventure wise but certainly emotionally that was the climax of every book and uh, i enjoyed getting them to that point whereas with artemis it was his plan you followed his plan and the the, the fun was could you guess what artemis's plan was 
and hopefully you could get some of it but then you did be one little twist in the tail you didn't foresee uh, and, and that's what i tried to do but with this it really is a more emotional journey uh, with two youngsters who um who are really really super fond of each other but still argue all the time dabble is a proud sponsor of author stories Dabble is an easy-to-use cloud-based writing tool that gives writers a way to organize, plot, and create amazing stories wherever they are. Write in our desktop app, on your Mac or Windows computer, tablet, or mobile device. Dabble syncs your latest version with the cloud on all your devices. Write anywhere and anytime inspiration strikes. We got you. Dabble is my preferred writing tool, and I think it will be yours as well. Visit DabbleWriter.com for your free trial. You have an amazing story idea. You execute the writing and editing flawlessly, and now the only thing missing are readers. We can help you go from author to author superhero with Story Origin. Story Origin is a one-stop shop for marketing tools with a community of amazing authors working together to find reviewers, build mailing lists, increase sales, and collect feedback from beta readers. Everything an author needs, all in one place from providing review copies or beta copies, reader magnets to ensure you stay connected with readers, easily distribute audio promo codes, universal retail links to send readers directly to the proper point of purchase, or provide direct download links for members of your mailing list. Story Origin has all the tools you need in one easy-to-use site. Use the promo code ASP21 at checkout when subscribing to the yearly plan, and you will get 10% off your first year. This code will expire December 31st, so hurry over and subscribe now. StoryOriginApp.com Owen, oh, um, a, a few years ago, you and I met um, when you were promoting your book High Fire, uh, oh, which yeah. was an adult fantasy novel. And, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people came along because they had been fans of the the Artemis Fowl series and um, maybe read them themselves growing up uh, or maybe read them to their kids and then experienced this other tale that you told that is completely different. Um a lot of authors that that write long running series start to feel pigeonholed uh, in a way because the the thing that made them popular, um, you know, it it, it becomes a um, kind of velvet handcuffs if you want to think of it that way. Yeah. You know, the, you want to do something different, but you don't want to disrupt this well oiled machine that that's going on. Um, as a writer who has uh, had a very successful series, but then also, you know, writes other things, um, how important is it for you to be able to uh, to write adult fiction um, as well as the the foul universe books? Um, and, and how important is it for a writer to uh, to get to express themselves in all the different ways? Um, it, is that ultimately good for? for the the foul universe and the things that you know that that uh that people come to expect from you um can, can you just talk a little bit about you know the writer's life and and how it is that you feel fulfilled in all of the things that you do well i think what what you said there about is it good for the foul universe if you go off in different directions and i really think it is i think um, that really helps give you a re recharges your interest in stuff that you had done previously. And I absolutely believe that if I hadn't done um, alternate books between the foul, uh, the Artemis foul books, that they would have suffered because I would have been so fed up by the time I got to book four that it would have been just I would have dashed it off. Uh, so um, I always made a point of between nearly every I think I did two in a row. But between nearly every other one, I had did one or sometimes two books in between just to keep myself interested. Um, because at the end of the day, I'm sitting out here in an office on my own for 10 months of the year and I, I have to be interested. But also I recognize that this is a complete luxury. In most writers, and in, I include myself in, in my early on in my career, you didn't have the luxury of saying, well, I'm going to leave this successful series for a couple of years and uh, and do something else that may or may not make any money and might not even get published. Uh, 
most people just can't really do that because we've all got kids, we've got mortgages and uh, we've got families and uh, we like to go on the occasional holiday. So I, I was very, very fortunate and I still am that I was able to say, you know what, I'm stepping away. I'm finishing this series after eight books when, you know, fantasy writers regularly do 20 books in a series. But I decided, no, I was gonna, after eight, I was going to, I was done. But it wasn't a slam dunk for me because I think I made, I may have made the wrong decision. When I finished the Artemis Fowl books, I did another trilogy, a fantasy trilogy called Warp. And they were, I mean, I thought they were really good books and they were just as good, if not better in some ways than the Artemis Fowl book. But they didn't really get any traction because it was straight after the Artemis Fowl series and then launching into another series. And I, I think what I should have done was just stepped away completely and done something completely different. And and I think that's what I decided to do with High Fire. Um, I thought I would uh, I would just do a fantasy book for grown ups and and just it's it's very wacky. I mean, if you read it, it's it's quite off the wall and this loony. And but I I enjoyed it so much. I enjoyed it so much. And then the fact that it did really well was a was a bonus. But it gave me a lot of confidence because I think my confidence took a dent after Warp. I thought, you know, that's it for me. I'm not gonna be able to um, be successful anymore. Really, I'll go, I'm gonna be like I'm I'm gonna be an act like a 1980s pop band i'm just i'm just going to be singing the old tunes and there's nothing wrong with that and that's what i'm really doing in a way with the val twins but it, it makes it a bit more uh, palatable if you can then do a book like high fire in between and and go and tour that and and meet people who used to be artemis fans in the in the early 2000s and that that gave me a real kick so yeah it's very important for me just to be able to do what i feel like doing and that makes it sound very flippant and off the cuff. But when you do what you feel like doing as a writer, that takes a year. You know, you don't just do it over a weekend. So it's a big decision. I'm, if I'm going to do a book like High Fire, I know this is going to take me eight or nine months to write. And then I'm going to be touring it for a few months. So you're talking a full year of your life. So you have to really think about whether or not you're going to do it. So when I embarked on the, the trilogy of Warp, that was four or five years of writing and and when it didn't really connect i mean I, it does have kind of a loyal cultish following but it didn't have the kind of success i suppose that people were expecting it would have uh, and it took high far then to kind of to bring me back into the popular fold and give me the platform to to launch the bell twins so um i'm very grateful for that speaking of high fire did i see some news recently about maybe a a, a TV show and Nicolas Cage attached yeah. to that. What 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 is that about? Um, yeah, it was bought by I forget which TV company bought it. Uh, I think it's Warner 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 Television. It could be. I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, but yeah, Nicolas Cage. They wrote the pilot. I looked at the, I read the pilot. It's really really fantastic. And Nicolas Cage is attached to be Vern the Dragon. So I think he's on a bit of a renaissance at the moment. So. Uh, that would be great if that went ahead. Um, I, as far as I know, I sh- we should know in, the, in the early in the new year if if the pilot is going to be greenlit, and um, that that would be very exciting. I, so, I can't uh, wait to see how they work in the 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 flash dance Easter egg. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, that'll, that'll be I just good. tried to think. I mean, it just amuses me to think. You know, what do people not expect from a dragon? So they're expecting a noble creature they're not expecting someone who wears cargo shorts and you know likes linda ronstadt and flash dance and uh, a martinis so i just uh it, it, it for me it's an exercise in opposite so i'm trying to put in do whatever people don't expect from a certain genre and then that's what i give them and of course the downside of that is a lot of people who love dragons don't want that you know they want game of thrones dragon uh, and they don't want any other kind of dragon, and that's fair enough. But I always think there's room um, for people who like something a little bit different. Uh, and luckily, luckily, that proved to be the case with High Fire. When you you talked earlier about um, how the that original Artemis Fowl book um, started kind of spreading like like wildfire in a lot of ways, and it started popping up all over the world in interesting places 
and and I forget how many languages it's been published in now. It's it's published literally all over the world. Um, are are any of those markets that are you surprised that that this kind of book and this series and this world have connected with people uh, in, in interesting places? Are there any places that really caught you by surprise that oh I I had no idea that this would go over there? Yeah, and I think it was probably due to my own ignorance on on you know on about those places. But I suppose I thought really it, it was so Irish because it's about leprechauns and it's about it's set in Ireland and it's a very Irish family and with a lot of Irish idioms. So I I kind of expect I was kind of hoping that America would pick it up because you know we have a lot there's a lot of Irish Americans and um, yeah. people know about Irish mythology, so I I was I was hopeful that would happen. So I felt it was a good fit for there, but there are other places then that I wasn't I didn't know I didn't feel it would happen. Uh, so I was very surprised when Germany, for example, it got really popular in Germany, and when I went there there would be massive crowds of people and I just I didn't know why that happened and uh, and I found out that Germany people German people love our Ireland as well and they love Irish people and they love the Irish culture and um, and a lot of people uh, told me in Germany oh they, a lot of their family lived there and so when I returned to Ireland I just started to kind of casually ask around and it, I was amazed how many German people live in Ireland <laughs> and then I went down to Brazil and I was invited to Brazil and, and I thought well you know no one's going to have heard of me down here and uh, it, it was I was it was nearly mobbed I was it was almost embarrassing how many people were there and uh, I just couldn't I didn't understand why this was happening and and I was asking people what is it about this book and the, the kids would tell me what they liked about it. the Artemis Fowl character was his agency he had control over his own life and that they sometimes felt that they didn't have. And of all the kids I asked, that was the number one thing that came back, that uh, this boy, Artemis, he's in charge of the school principal. He's controlling his parents. Uh, he's he's the, he's the guy in charge. And a lot of these kids felt at the age of 12 that they were just as smart as the grown-ups in their life, but they just had no power. And uh, that never really occurred to me until I asked someone about it. So, and that's a thing that came up over and over again all over the world. That above the humor, above the adventures, and above the magic, what they liked was that this guy was this twelve-year-old was in charge, uh, and that that's a very interesting thing when you think about it. It absolutely is. Um, one thing that I find interesting is that um, I think a lot of times writers will will try to not put too much of 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 who they are or their local culture uh into their books because they're afraid that people won't get it um yeah and and you found that that by writing a very irish book full of irish um you know fairy tales uh that that people around the world did connect with it um and, and that that says something about um about not being afraid to to tell your stories the way they are and um, it, people are, are always looking for, for new things to, to, uh, to wrap their brains around. Yeah. And I think people like, uh, you know, movie companies like Marvel have really realized the strength, you know, of indigenous, uh, mythical cycles and, you know, they're not shy. They have got Shang-Chi now and they have Thor, of course. So they're, they don't really, they realize that there's a, there's an essential truth in all of these legends that we can all latch on to. And I think the same is true in Artemis. It's really a family story. It's it's about a boy and, and you know, trying to save his family and, and about the, the magical fairies that I think every culture has really. You, even when, uh, I think every country I've been to, they have fairies. Even Russia, I think only have one, but they still have a fairy. So uh, everyone can, can connect with that and when I was writing the, the books I wasn't really imagining that anyone would read it outside Ireland so I had no problem writing an Irish story but uh, it was only when I heard it was going to be published overseas that I began to worry that nobody uh, would connect with it but by then it was already written That's amazing. well and and families of, about story and agent I mean, about family and agency those are those are human stories it doesn't matter where you're from we all yeah. want yeah exactly things. Um, oh, and I know you've got a, a another um, 
a store appearance that you've got to do in just a minute. So um, we're going to have to let you go. Um, but the Foul Twins, Get What They Deserve, is available everywhere now. We're going to have links to it in the show notes. Um, tell people where they can find you. I know that your website is a, uh, a great resource for all the stuff that you do. Where can they locate you online? My website is very simply owencolfer.com. So that's E-O-I-N-C-O-L-F for uh, Foxtrot E-R. Uh, dot com and everything all the links are there all the descriptions a lot a few little videos plenty of question and answer sessions so it's all there and you can leave me a message and i'd love to hear from you excellent we'll link that up as well owen always fun to catch up with you thank you for for being my 1200th guest today 1200th guest and i, I was probably your 1100th as well so <laughs> i'm in there i'll, I I'll have just to come on, i'll come on every hundred that's my goal <laughs> thanks, thanks Owen Thank and we'll Bye. cut it right there um, thank you sir and um, stay in touch well, let's do it again uh, absolutely but someday right. we'll do it again live but that that's a pleasure Hank I'll talk to you soon okay thanks bye bye now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves the Jason Crane series Natalie it's Artie listen I'm going to be late for dinner. I ran out of gas on... He climbed out of the car and peered at the sign. On Sleepy Hollow Road? There's nothing but trees, and I have to find a gas station. Save me a drumstick. He hung up his cell and stuck it in his pocket, zipping his jacket. He was going to have to walk and pray somebody picked him up. A sliver of crescent moon hung above, surrounded by clouds. Like a grinning drunk asleep in a puddle. Artie walked, using his tablet as a flashlight, eyes on the gravel ahead. He crossed over a dark ravine. The trunks and overhanging branches were matted thick with wild grapevines and threw a cavernous gloom over the road. A figure stood at a crossroads ahead. It looked pale and wan and blue. A woman? He had an impression of fragility and age and thought of his warty old landlady but his landlady would not be standing at a crossroads in the dark. Excuse me? Artie said, surprised by the fear in his own voice. Do you know where I can find a gas station? I'm... I'm empty. Then let me fill you, the figure whispered. It rushed at him. It entered him. He dropped the tablet fell to his knees, and lost his body to another driver. When Artie woke again, he was dangling in midair. The woods were pitch black. The only lights were fireflies. Fireflies everywhere, like dancing stars. He struggled and cried out, his yellow sneakers trying to find the ground. Shh, said a voice. It will all be over soon. Panic rose. He felt invisible hands on his legs, on his arms, invisible fingers around his neck, reaching up the back of his shirt. He heard the sound of water running below, high and agitated, as if through a stony brook. The crescent moon swung out of the sky, falling into the water. Blood rushed into his cheeks. He realized he had been flipped upside down. He yelled and groped, flecking his own face with spit, helpless to drive away whatever was attacking him. He felt a sharp pain between his shoulder blades, and air flew out of his lungs. A spray of blood hit his cheeks, hot and clinging. His hands found a sharp branch protruding from his body. It had speared him through his back and out through his chest. He tried to say help, but had no air to form the word. Blood poured up his body. No, it poured down. It only felt as if it were rising, climbing his neck, covering his face gathering in his scalp. He reached for the ribbon of blood that fell from his crown into the trickle of moonlight below. The ribbon slipped through his fingers. It thinned, choked, became a tiny rivulet. His tanks were empty, not even fumes. His engine began to sputter. The flow became a drip, a maddening drip like the drip, drip, drip of his kitchen faucet, the drip his landlady hadn't fixed the drip that kept him up at night. This drip would not be keeping him up. 
He would sleep very well this night. Very well indeed. The fireflies slipped into shadow. A figure appeared, blue as gaslight, bony and toothless, a crone from a fairy tale. Thank you, my friends, she whispered. I am thankful for this good harvest. She neared, scrutinized him with manic intensity, and turned away, muttering to herself in a sing-song rhythm as she, too, vanished into the trees. A man may toil from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. <laughs>